Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, my name is Alejandra Castillo and I am on the board of the American Constitution Society. My day job, I'm the, I'm the CEO of YWCA USA, but I am very passionate about the work that we do at American Constitution Society, also known as ACS. Today's panel discussion is really uh, going to be a great uh, uh, opportunity to really demystify the political appointment process. Um, we have with us some extraordinary individuals and I will ask them to introduce themselves in just a minute. But I wanna make sure that um, this is a, a webinar, it's a, uh, an opportunity to ask questions, to, um, to really get an understanding of what does it mean to be a political appoint, uh, appointee serving our nation and really serving our nation through the executive branch. Um, as ACS, we are a 501c3, and our effort here is to really educate and inform uh, and really uh, excite our members uh, to make sure that as they think about, as you think about your careers and, uh, and opportunities, um, this is yet another way that you can serve our country. So I want to make sure that we uh, keep this conversation uh, as informative as possible and also have a, a, a discussion not just of uh, what we think may be needed in terms of uh, the work of the executive branch, but also what role can you play as, as attorney, as members of the legal profession. So with that, I want to um, introduce um, our incredible panel and I'm going to start with Lisa Brown. Uh, Lisa, can you just introduce yourself and, uh, and pretty much give us a reason uh, an, an explanation of what your uh, role and journey has been uh, as a political appointee. Sure. Well, first, thanks for having me. My, as some of you know, I was the executive director of ACS for a number of years. So ACS is very dear to my heart. Um, so the answer when ACS comes a calling is always yes, of course I will. Um, so my political journey was I started Actually, I started in a career job at the Office of Legal Counsel at the Justice Department. So I'd been at a law firm, made partner, ended up going to OLC, and then from there ended up moving to the White House as first deputy counsel and then counsel to Vice President Gore. So all of that was during the Clinton administration. Um, and then um, I was summarily kicked out of my job when um, the Supreme Court decided the Bush v. Gore case and went in the, back into the private sector. Um, and at that point, actually, was when I was running the American Constitution Society. And then with President um, Obama, um, I was, ran agency review for the Obama-Biden transition and then went into the White House as staff secretary and then to OMB as the acting chief performance officer. So all the, everything except the first job at OLC were political positions. Excellent. And thank you. We're gonna come back to some of that wonderful journey that you've had. Um, I want to now introduce, we have two Lisas on our panel, but Lisa Elman, if I may uh, call on you, give us a, a perspective of um, not only what you're doing now, but your uh, political appointee experience as well. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. And it's great to see uh, familiar faces and great to be with you all. Uh, my name is Lisa Elman. I'm currently a partner at Hogan Lovell's Law Firm. Um, but my background is I worked for the Obama administration for several years. Uh, I came off of the campaign. So my, my background is I had actually been, um, you know, had a wonderful law professor at University of Chicago Law School who, who was a, good me a great mentor to me, um, Professor Barack Obama, who then, of course, um, became, you know, ran for Senate actually while I was in his class. And then, uh, you know, fast forward a few years, I worked on his campaign from the beginning back in 2007, 2008, and then went to the transition team where I worked with Lisa on the agency review team as part of the transition. And then moved over to the White House where I was the legal director for Office of Presidential Personnel. So my job was actually to figure out kind of a lot of the nominations and appointments for legal jobs in particular. I was tasked with staffing the administration right when the president takes over. Of course, there are several thousand political appointments. And um, I was there for the first, most of the first year of the administration. Then I moved uh, in a political appointment to the Department of Justice where I worked at the Office of Legal Policy. I then moved back to the White House um, at, at the Office of Management and Budget, as well as the Office of Science and Technology Policy. So I've had several roles. I had several roles during the administration, 
um, but look forward today to talk um, with you all in particular about the, my role at PPO. So Lisa, uh, Lisa Elman, you've given us a, a, a lots of great questions that we're going to go back to um, once we finish our, our, our introductions, but uh, I hope everyone's taking some, some really good notes. Um, and I also want to introduce Ron Weiss, who is, um, who is joining us today and uh, would love to hear about your experience, Ron, uh, as you journeyed through the political appointment process. Sure. Well, thank you, Alejandra, and so nice to be with you all this afternoon. Um, I am currently the Dean of the University of Baltimore School of Law. I don't want to give a shout out to some of my students yeah. who are watching this webinar. We have an active ACS chapter at UB. Um, but my journey began many years before. I worked on Capitol Hill first in the Senate uh, in the 1990s for Senator Ted Kennedy and eventually became his chief counsel on the Judiciary Committee. Then I went to a law firm, then back to the Hill, worked for Harry Reid when he was first minority leader and ultimately majority leader in the 2007-2008 period. And then I was appointed as the Assistant Attorney General for Legislative Affairs by President Obama. Proud of that and, and uh, had a Senate confirmation process that uh, got a hearing uh, uh, that my kids got to watch. Um, and um, in the Justice Department, um, I had staff, so I can talk a little bit about how uh, not Senate confirmed political appointments go. Um, but I was there from about uh, 2009 to 2012 uh, when I went to Baltimore. Fantastic. So we've gotten, we, we've been able to at least get the introductions underway. Now let's just dig in a bit. Um, let's dig in from the perspective of, uh, and I'm going to ask Lisa Brown to tell us a little bit about what is a political appointment? What are some of the, um, the, what is the difference between a political appointee and a career uh, civil servant? Sure. So big picture, um, a political appointee is anybody who is appointed by the president, vice president, or any of the cabinet secretary. Um, and as there are about 4,000, Lisa Elman can check me on this, but I think there are about 4,000 political appointments. About 20% of those require Senate confirmation, as Ron was referring to. So there are, the good news is there are a lot of them that are not Senate confirmed. Um, and, you know, one of the big differences, obviously, between political and career is that as a political appointee, um, you have the job while your administration is, in, is um, in office. And so you lose your job when the president or whoever appointed you loses their job. Unlike career um, government employees who are, make up the majority of agencies, I mean, and are spectacular. I mean, I think it's something that um, people have to realize is that they, they are, and they know how to do their jobs through administrations, right? right? And so the reason for the political layer is really that you wanna make sure when a president comes into office that this, his or her senior team are on, the, on board with your policy priorities, right? So that the, the, it's basically the senior positions at every agency are going to be political in addition to the, you know, the head of independent agencies, um, things like that. And, but then there are, the, and the, sort of the most senior echelon is the way I think of it as political, plus there are the sort of special assistant type roles. So there are places for Schedule Cs, for people to come in who don't have a years and years necessarily of experience for I think actually some of the plum jobs, because if you are a special assistant to a cabinet secretary or undersecretary, you often are the pinch, you, you get given all these just sort of different assignments to go run and take care of things. And I think that can be a, it can be a great way of um, uh, entering the government, learning about the government. And, and I think it's important to remember that obviously the White House people think about everybody in the White House is political aside from um, the sort of national security folks who tend to be detailed from their agencies, but the people that you think about in the White House Domestic Policy Council or National Economic Council or General Council, all of those folks are political roles. So Lisa Brown, you've, you've given us a, a pretty high level understanding. Uh, you said 20% are uh, Senate confirmed, and then we have kind of the 80% Schedule Cs. But I want to go to Lisa Elman and give us some context. You know, at the beginning of a, camp of, of, a, of a new administration, tell us a little bit about what does the transition team do and how does this massive undertaking from an HR perspective come to bear? I mean, we have to now, you know, once a, a, a candidate has one office, 
there's a whole rush to make sure that these positions are filled. What does that process look like? You're on mute, Lisa. Um, so yeah, Thank so you. it takes a while to fill all of these positions, right? So if around 4,000 political positions, um, they're not all filled on day one. In fact, it takes years to fill these political positions. So um, when you, uh, you know, when I was on the transition team, one of the most immediate things that I was focused on, I, I remember my boss just saying, you know, please just handle this, was figuring out who are the acting heads of each of these offices on day one. And this was one of the first orders that President Obama signed after, um, you know, after he took office, there's a line of succession and these, these jobs are gonna be vacant. I would note there's, a, a, you know, one, um, you know, Lisa mentions that as a political appointee, your, your job generally ends. There are some term appointments. So for example, like the FAA administrator is termed. So the FAA administrator was, was appointed by Donald Trump, but he will be there if he wants to be um, into, you know, until his term would end. And that happened as well. Obama's appointee stayed, stayed um, partly into the Trump administration. So some of them are terms, but for the most part, it is true that, you know, you are there at the will of the president. Um, they're not, you know, and it's physically impossible. You know, there's a vetting, there, there's a whole lot that goes into choosing these appointments. And you can, you can, you need to kind of start with, you know, the cabinet level, um, senior level positions, you know, deputy secretaries, assistant secretaries, and then kind of filter, you know, there's a lot of great other jobs available that are less senior level that are more, that like the Schedule C appointments that, that Lisa mentioned that are great jobs. There's also executive assistants, even for folks who, you know, haven't been through law school. So there's all different levels of seniority. I think, you know, during the transition team, the the focus was on figuring out who are going to be the acting heads in the meantime and then figuring out you know at a very senior level the first priority is to fill those senior level positions and get as many people in at a senior level as possible while also you know depending on what the president's priorities are looking at the various agencies and figuring out where do we need people in the short term where do you know and where should we start filling in some of the more junior level positions even without that more senior level representation so, you know, and obviously there's a long list of types of, of appointments, you know, we're talking, we're focusing here, I think, on the White House and all the agencies, but of course there are ambassador spots, you know, there are boards and commissions, all different kinds of every type of board or commission you could think about, you know, there's going to be appointments for that. Um, there's all different types of, of appointments. Um, whether you're se very senior level or, or more junior level. For me, my focus was on the legal appointments. So that was not just Department of Justice, but we had um, you know, all of the general counsel's offices across every agency, for example. A lot of the policy roles, a lot of the legal you know, lawyers were looking to get into policy roles. They're not traditional lawyer jobs, but they were still you know, appropriate for lawyers. Um, a, a lot the inspector general offices, um, you know, so lots of different places to look for these types of jobs. Lisa, one thing you might mention, um, you alluded to this, is the, there's an um, interrelationship between PPO on these, on these appointments and the agency head. Because the agency head has their views about who they want to bring in with them. And it is a, so that it's not, if you don't get a job at the very beginning, like from the transition, as Lisa's indicating, there are, you know, people do bring in folks who they've worked with before. And it's an ongoing conversation between PPO and the relevant cabinet secretary. So one thing that I, one thing that was asked is um, to uh, uh, call out the acronyms, right? Um, just so that people can follow through. <laughs> So Presidential Personnel Office? Yep, PPO uh, is Presidential Personnel Office. Great. So that's the office. If you're looking for a political appointment, you definitely want to know who they are in the beginning of any administration. I want to go to Ron. Uh, Ron, tell us a bit about uh, not just the role that you played and how your journey was, but as the dean, uh, as, as, as a dean, what recommendations or guidance would you give uh, uh, just newly minted lawyers, either who have graduated from law school and are waiting for the bar or who have passed the bar? What, what, what roles are there to play um, as an appointee for, for newly minted lawyers too? Sure. Well, one great thing about the law as a profession is uh, that there are so many paths. I mean, we've each described our individual paths, but for my uh, law school graduates, um, I tell them, you know, you start down a path and then it may be a detour, it may take you into a forest and you got to get back on a different road. Um, but a law degree obviously helps you 
uh, do so many things. You can practice law, you can be involved in business as a transactional lawyer in, in-house or at a law firm, and certainly you can be in government. And I encourage my students to very seriously consider public service and the start of a, of a new administration, if there is to be a new administration. And let's all quickly say, uh, no one's pres presuming anything or measuring drapes uh, prematurely, uh, but if there is a new administration in Washington, that does present a great opportunity for lawyers at all levels of seniority to consider coming into public service from wherever they are. I was going to observe, and both Lisa and Lisa have uh, alluded to this, I'll say it from my experience, there's sort of this um, step-down process. So in my own experience, when President Obama, when uh, Senator Obama was elected president, he decided that Eric Holder was going to be attorney general. That was a very personal decision for him. Then, uh, soon to be Attorney General Holder, reached out to begin to form his uh, senior uh, administration within the Justice Department. And that was obviously a process with uh, intense discussion and negotiation with the uh, personnel office in the soon to be White House. But then after he asked me to serve, after Attorney General Holder asked me to serve as an assistant attorney general, I then got to uh, select individuals who would work in my office. I had to get approval from Attorney General Holder and people around him. And then in turn, there was a process back to the, to the White House personnel office. So all along, there are different levels of consultation. But um, a point to make is that even I, as a, you know, merely an assistant attorney general, I was in the position to bring other lawyers and some young lawyers into the department as political appointees at the beginning of that administration. So, um, and thank you for that, uh, Ron. You said it very eloquently. No one here is presuming anything. This is just to make sure that we are informing and, and, and uh, providing as much uh, guidance. Um, question about the plum book we have on the chat. Is the plum book static? Are these the positions that are always there or does it reflect the uh, priorities of the president uh, uh, at, the, at that moment in time? And, and what would you say about the Plum Book in general? Any I, one of you? I would just say that the Plum Book is incredibly important. What we always told people was um, come to us with an ask. So don't just say I'm a talented lawyer and I'm interested in, in having a job in, in working for President Obama. Okay, that's really, that's great. Um, but you need to be more specific. And we would always ask, you know, um, candidates to be to look through the plum book and actually identify specific positions that they were actually interested and qualified to do. Um, and, you know, while also maintaining flexibility that if those jobs weren't available, you'd be, you know, interested in something else. But, but the point is that the, the plum book is a great guide. I mean, it's, you know, these jobs um, for the, I, I believe it's updated, you know, every four years. I was just looking through the 2020 version. So, you know, I, I would definitely, the plum book is your friend if you're interested in, in any of these jobs. And you're, you'll find stuff in there that you didn't even know existed, right? There's all kinds of different jobs out there that you don't even realize in terms of the appointments. And you might start out thinking you only want to work for DOJ and you definitely want to work for DOJ, but then, you know, these are, there are general counsel's offices at every agency. There's great legal opportunities at, at other agencies, and you'll be able to find those in the, in the plum book. That's great. And, and I will say, you know, I've served in two administration and the plum book is critically important because as, as Lisa Elman said, sometimes you don't even realize how many different agencies exist within a department. And uh, as moderator, I'll take a moment of privilege just to say, uh, again, to echo what's been said before, because we're lawyers, we have this nimbleness to really play an incredible role no matter where you are. I was at Commerce for eight years and I loved every single minute of it because there's just a breadth and scope of what Commerce does that people just don't understand. Ron, I wanna go, to, go back to you and a Senate confirmed position uh, is incredibly uh, interesting in so many ways. You get to, uh, with consultation, to build a team. But walk us through that Senate confirmation process. Everything well, from the forms, the preparation, sure. uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, let me start by observing that there is a Senate confirmation process underway right now, unfortunately, from the perspective of some of us. Um, and while that's not the subject of this webinar, I will observe that it, it um, offers some lessons to us. One important lesson, uh, which uh, we're seeing 
now in the headlines is that uh, under rules changes over a number of years and by different uh, parties, um, the minority has very little say in whether someone will be confirmed. That didn't used to be the case. Um, there was an opportunity for the minority to block an appointment, but that's not true anymore for both executive branch and judicial nominations all the way up to the Supreme Court. Um, the majority can work its will. There are various ways in which the minority can shape the process and slow it down, but ultimately it requires a simple majority vote to be confirmed. So that's one lesson. The other lesson that I see from the current headlines is that uh, the chairman plays an important role. Each nomination is within the purview, the portfolio of one committee or another. So the Justice Department nominations and judicial nominations are in the Senate Judiciary Committee. And so current chairman Lindsey Graham has an important role here. You note that um, Senator Grassley, who used to chair that committee, said that if he were chair, he wouldn't take up the nomination of uh, an individual to replace uh, the late Justice Ginsburg, but he's going to defer to the current chairman. So that's just a little illustration of the power of a chairman to move the business. And now it appears that uh, Chairman Graham is going to move this nomination. Back to your question, Alejandro. Um, it begins with paperwork. Uh, so when I was asked to take on the job, I had to fill out a lot of paperwork uh, to, as part of a vetting. Um, my writings and so forth were first reviewed by the uh, executive branch officials who were putting forward my nomination. And then um, my questionnaire, there's a, each committee has a questionnaire, so the Senate Judiciary Committee had a questionnaire that I had to fill out and attach to it all of my writings. Um, and that um, questionnaire went to the, uh, to the committee. Um, it's a very voluminous uh, questionnaire if, you, if you've had experience that involves writing. And so it takes a lot of time and you have to do it with great care because if you leave something out or accidentally misstate something, it can very much hurt the nomination. Um, one important point is that um, each nominee has someone in the administration who is shepherding you through the process. Um, and so uh, you're not on your own. It might be an agency lawyer. So in my case, the um, uh, people in the uh, Office of Legislative Affairs were helpful. Um, for other agencies and in other circumstances, it might be White House Counsel's Office or someone from the Office of Presidential Personnel. But someone is helping you navigate. Ultimately, you're going to meet with uh, either the staff or the member um, of the committee who uh, is going to take up that nomination. And in some cases, as in mine, there's going to be a hearing. And then um, you hope that uh, uh, your nomination moves forward from there to a vote on the Senate floor. Ron, thank you for bringing up the issue uh, regarding the current um, vacancy on the Supreme Court and what's happening. Um, I want to make sure that everyone sees in the chat box that we have posted your most recent uh, op-ed in the Baltimore Sun just about that issue. So for those who are uh, part of this uh, um, uh, webinar, please, um, please take a look at Ron's latest uh, article. Appreciate that. I want to go back, Lisa. Uh, I think you wanted to inter uh, interject on something, but I also wanted to uh, take get your take on what does it look like um, from where you sat in the Obama administration, and maybe your recollections of the different, uh, if, if there were any differences, of what it meant to be a Senate confirmed back in the years of Clinton versus when you were in the Obama administration. What has changed and what should people be uh, uh, concerned about or mindful of? So the first thing I would say is I was in some ways blessed that I was never in a Senate confirmed position. And it is just easier. It is, you know, you do have to fill out the SF-86 and fill out the ethics forms, but you don't have to go through the, what Ron's describing of all those huge long questionnaires with all your writing. And unfortunately, I actually chaired um, a working group on streamlining the paperwork for executive nominations, um, which is a congressionally mandated um, working group. And because it has become a gotcha game. And as Ron's indicating, don't you dare forget something, questions get asked in slightly different ways and by Senate Judiciary than by PPO or, and it becomes, unfortunately, you know, for many confirmations, they go through smoothly and it's easy. But if you are in one of those high profile ones and it becomes controversial, you really want to make sure that you have and focused on the forms, focused on the differences between them, and um, it's it's an arduous process. And I think it's really unfortunate because part of why 
Lisa's indicating how long it can take to fill these positions is that it's become so politicized. And it's just, it doesn't do any service to our government, regardless of political administration, when it takes months and months and years to get your senior people in because you know, it's a time, transitions are times of vulnerability for an administ for any administration, for the gov, for the country. And to have these gap, you don't want gaps. And if you have positions that are unfilled, the risks are just higher. Um, so I think that's, that is just to say, go into this with your eyes open, if you are going into a Senate confirmed position and, you know, think on this whole change with, I can't, social media, right? I, it's hard to get my head around, Lisa, for you, like getting that, <laughs> was hard before <laughs> yeah. now, you know, and I, I, for one, couldn't begin to find everything that I've, you know, written in some way, you know, I'm careful on social media, so it's, I'm old, so that's probably the best, I haven't, I haven't done a lot on social media, um, but I think that's the, probably the biggest change, sort of game changer is going to be the amount of information that's out there, um, you just have to be ready to, um, own own up and address yeah. and, and i guess this is a, a good time to to thank ron for being among the brave to not get discouraged because the process can yes. be very discouraging and for individuals who may be in the private sector sometimes they have to step down from their positions while they await confirmation and that also has a you know both a psychological emotional economic toll on individuals um uh, Lisa, Lisa Elman, I wanted to go back to you and, and just ask, um, what did you, what, what do you believe back in the Obama administration as you were thinking about transition, um, transition and Senate confirm? Let's stick stick with the Senate confirm just for a little while, um, as well as with controversial positions. Um, do candidates go in solo? Is there a way that uh, either the transition team or the White House? Uh, um, a presidential personnel uh, helps them sh shepherd them. How does that process look? Um, I just want to make sure that people don't think that they're just going to go into these uh, these situations by themselves. What what's the ecosystem of the uh, nomination process uh, when you're either going for a Senate confirmed position or or a highly controversial uh, non Senate confirmed position? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I mean, I so I can speak uh, in this conversation as someone who actually was doing the vetting of some of these candidates. And I, I vetted a few Senate confirms candidates and we would try to, you know, before even the nomination, the process starts. And the goal of the interviews and the vet, the vetting interviews would be to kind of tease out a lot of what Lisa and Ron have described that you might experience on the Hill in terms of these gotcha games, in terms of you're essentially, once you're a nominee, you're a political pawn in a much bigger game, right? So um, recognizing that people are going to take things that you have previously written, even though you meant something when you wrote it, they're gonna take it out of context. They're going to say things, they say potentially say that you, you know, meant intended um, to say things that you didn't mean to say, you know, you, we, I would review all of the writings where possible. Obviously, there are some very prolific people who are, you know, nominees, and that's tough, but you try to literally review all of the different public writings that are out there. Like Lisa said, social media does make this more tricky because then it's like, you know, review every single thing that could be out there that could be seen by the public. Um, and then some of the more traditional issues, which probably haven't really changed as much, but are there you know, did you pay all the taxes that you were due? Like, you know, you had to go back and literally like with your accountant, the accountant, the nominees would have to, you know, sometimes, you know, pay the federal government a hundred dollars that they didn't realize that they would have owed. Or, you know, are there nanny issues? Did you have an employee without paying that, you know, paying taxes on them that actually disqualified a fair number of candidates? Um, are there, uh, you know, in, in just similar types of things that are out there that in there is there anything that would come out during the process that could be of an embarrassment to the administration about you and you know that would sometimes lead to some pretty pretty honest answers and sometimes it led to you know but it's better to be honest and and you you want to you want to be able to foresee what's going to you know that at the end of the day the administration is on your side and just trying to protect you and trying to protect the president and trying to protect the administration. So it's very important to just go into these, 
you know, recognizing that it's much, the, the process itself is much bigger than yourself. You're absolutely going to be accompanied by, you'll have a vetting attorney, whether from PPO, whether from White House Counsel's Office. Um, another office that's been engaged on the judicial nominations and appointments is the Office of Legal Policy at the Department of Justice. They do vetting of judicial nominations. Um, especially the lower court nomination. So there's there's a lot of people that are in, in supporting roles here, but of course, you know, the administration is focused on the administration's equities and what they recognize each political nomination appointment is a certain amount of political capital that the administration has and how much will, political capital are they willing or will need to spend on getting your nomination through um, Congress. And so that's the calculus that takes place. Someone on the on the chat has asked, um, when you talk about public writing, does that also include publicly filed court documents, pleading, motions, paper? Sure, anything, anything that's accessible to the public. Yes. So let's let's turn this portion of of uh, since we've hit the the midpoint, let's turn this portion por portion of the conversation as to what makes a successful political appointee. Um, both entering, uh, what are the things that you're, that you're either looking for through either through the lens of transition or Ron in your position as you, as you create your team or Lisa with your experience, Lisa Brown with your experience um, in, in two administration. What are some of the salient uh, characteristics, experience, skills, um, both at the, at the entry level schedule C as well as at the um, Senate confirm? Anyone want to take a, a, a quick step at that? The first is substance. Go ahead. Go ahead. Lisa. I was just say the first thing is is substance, right? For most, right? That you are you know your stuff and you're good. I and mean, then one of the things the first time I went to the White House that I was really struck me is all of these political appointees. There were super smart, dedicated, committed people doing their best, right? These were not political hacks. These are people that are just working their tails off. And you're usually hired to fill a particular role. So the, you know, just for any job, part of this is your skill set. I mean, Ron was looking for, you know, people with particular skill sets in his office. So I think that just, you know, don't forget, that's just a sort of fundamental piece of it to begin with. Um, and then it's, I mean, my journey to my first political appointment was, you can't always, it was random, right? It mattered that I was a Democrat, but it was more that somebody recommended me to Gore's new council and he needed a deputy, right? And so the relationships that you all have, that's, those are going to matter, right? As in, if, if Biden wins and you're filling out a new administration, um, everything you've been doing as a lawyer every day matters because that's going to be the reputation that is going to actually have somebody say wait he or she would be great for a job and keep your eye on you know people that you work with a lot who then go into the administration because they'll be looking to take some good people with them so we're gonna we're gonna hold on the relationship because that's a big question like what what does that all how does that all play out so we're gonna hold on that but ron can you can you tease out what does uh, skills sets. What what does that look like? Right. I was going to uh, kind of um, add two elements to Lisa's good summary. One, diversity matters a lot. It certainly does. It did in, in the Obama administration. I think it should matter, and certainly would matter in a Biden administration. And, and so, as you're building a team, even for a, you know a relatively small component within the Justice Department, as I was, I was very concerned about um, making sure that uh, I was recruiting. Um, widely and, and open to suggestions from, uh, you know, different groups and, and, and pools of applicants. Uh, I wanted to make sure it wasn't just my friends. I mean, that's not a good way to recruit uh, in any employment setting. So uh, there's more to say about that, but just accept the proposition, diversity matters. A second thing I was going to say is uh, the importance of teamwork and to make sure that you're not hiring prima donnas. Everything in government, whether it's at the cabinet level or the agency level or even at the component level of the Justice Department. It's, you're, you're operating as a team. There's so much work to do and you have to work together and you have to have each other's backs and you have to cover for each other at different times. It's fast paced, everything that happens in, in government uh, always, but especially these days. And so I was especially notice, you know, conscious of uh, hiring people who would work well together and therefore building a team that would be a cohesive team 
uh, and I'm proud that I, I accomplished that. Um, but you know, uh, you might find a brilliant person uh, who's not a team player, and um, you'd have to ask yourself whether you want to take the chance. Um, so uh, those are some factors that I consider. And, and, and Ron, I, I just want to also add in terms of, the, I'm glad you brought diversity matters and, and it's diversity in its broadest sense as well. Geographical Absolutely. diversity. Uh, we don't want to hire just from one single law school. We want to hire from a variety of law schools. We want individuals who have a lived experience that is really reflective of America. So um, that, well I, I'm glad that Absolutely. you that you raised that point. Um, Lisa Elman, I, I want to piggyback on something that Ron said in terms of what are, what are you looking for uh, and how do, you, how do you make sure that people understand that these jobs are fast paced, they're not nine to five. Um, so making sure that you assess what quality of what your quality of life or work for, work life balance may be because um, you know, political appointments are not for the faint of heart, right? No, absolutely. Um, and, and just adding on to what Ron and Lisa said quickly on what, so I can tell you how the presidential personnel office was structured in terms of who are the priority candidates. In addition to skill set, obviously it's always, you know, with these political appointments, it's always a balancing of um, who's very, very well qualified for the job and who's demonstrated loyalty to the campaign or to the cause. Um, you want to kind of try to balance that and different presidents have balanced that in very different ways, I think it's fair to say. Um, but, you know, within the presidential personnel office, in addition to, you know, so I was responsible for legal appointments. I was also responsible for the Department of Education. I was also responsible for various other agencies. We each had kind of substantive, you know, like the, the appointments that we were responsible for, but there were also um, representatives of various constituencies that were prior priorities for the incoming administration. And for us, it was diversity. It was congressional priorities. So if you um, have members of Congress that are um, trying to, you know, lobby on your behalf, that's actually, that's really helpful because you're all automatically part of the congressional priority bucket. Um, obviously, can't, paid campaign staffers will get a first look. Um, they've given up, you know, much higher paying jobs. They've given up a good chunk of their life over the last year or two, particularly folks that are in at the primary level um, and, and all, as well as they will have developed relationships with people who will have White House roles. And so, you know, that's another kind of bucket of priority candidates. Um, other, other interest groups and groups like ACS who are, you know, you're pushing for your members, that kind of thing. That's in addition to the skill set. But, but like you said, Alejandra, I mean, it is very important to recognize that these, these jobs are, they are difficult you're managing a lot of you're, you're managing a lot of these jobs you're managing career folks who've been around for a really long time and um you're kind of trying to steer the ship and um with you know um an eye towards what the president and what the cabinet secretary wants and so um you know they are challenging roles and i think that's why lawyers in particular are well suited because we've been trained that way yeah, and, and I, I also want to um, underscore um, something that's on the on the Q&A. Uh, someone asked a question. They're a, they are a career um, uh, attorney at DOJ. How does that, going from a career civil servant to a political a, a appoint, appointment job look like? Is that allowable? Does it happen? I guess the caveat was what Lisa Brown said, that if you make that switch, you, you lose your job. Um, you don't have the same protection, right? So in my job, in my office at Office of Legal Policy at DOJ, we had a few folks who were career DOJ attorneys who switched into political positions. That's because they got to know the folks that were there um, and they had the right skill set. But then once the administration's over, they lose their job. You can't go from, you can go from being a career to a political appointment, but it's, you can't go for, it's called burrowing in. You can't go from being a political appointee into a career appointment. And so as long as you're sure you don't want to be a career, you know, a, a career, um, have that career job anymore, then, that, then that's fine. Yeah. So let's turn into, let's turn to the conversation of relationship because we have a lot of different individuals who are asking, is the only way to get a political appointment job through having contacts uh, with the campaign, with the transition team? Um, and I think what we've established here is 
you have to have the skills, right? The skills that are being uh, sought after. And then what does, what does the differential, uh, how does that play out? Is it a relationship? Is it a, who, who are your supporters and stakeholders in this process as you go through it? Uh, any one of you who can either uh, chime in. I think Lisa identified a lot of it, right? I mean, if you're, if you're a campaign on the campaign or done work for the campaign, even if you're not a full-time campaign staffer, right? That you want showing loyalty to the cause is one piece. Um, and then, you know, sometimes it's people who work on the agency review teams um, who become known through that. It, and some of it's the relationships that, as I indicated, that you've got, you have already, and it's the happenstance of somebody who gets appointed who you know, and you just, you can't, for that piece, you can't predict. It can help to have advocates. So Lisa can probably speak to this. I mean, you, you want to be a little careful because sometimes campaigns for people can backfire. Mm -hmm. um, but um, having people who, the, as Lisa's indicating, the constituency groups or Congress, people who, are, who will come in in support of you is helpful. Um, but it's, it, it's, and Lisa, maybe you can speak to the, ba the balance of it. Yeah, sure. I mean, it is really a balance. I mean, we had some people that went that that had that were sending us videos of themselves that were really ill thought out um, that were showing up at the White House trying to bring us cookies unannounced saying that they you know wanted to bring us baked goods just because you know it's like that's not gonna help it's not helpful to your cause <laughs> that are all all these people just trying to get jobs that were doing things that you're just like that's you know you want to you want to be tactful about it and recognize that this is. Um, you know, the networking is important. Some of it's going to be outside of your control, right? So there are a lot of people on the Obama campaign, for example, who wanted to work at the State Department. But the reality was that the deal that was struck with Se Secretary Clinton was that she was going to get to put her people in at the State Department. So the State Department political appointments were essentially not available to Obama campaign staff. That was just the reality of it. Um, and that's at a much higher level. These are, again, these appointments are political capital for the, the president. And so they spend them how they wish. Um, so I think, you know, having your, you know, being involved with organizations, being involved with the campaign to the extent you can, or being involved with other eff related efforts, um, a lot of it is networking, but it, you do want to be tactful and you want to, in building congressional support, I will just say that, you know, that did really help a lot of people who otherwise probably would not have gotten jobs was through congressional support. Um, and I see Ron. Yeah. I see. Let's pivot to Ron, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, I was going to observe that one common route into the administration is that you've actually worked on the Hill for a relevant senator or a relevant committee or yeah. a relevant House member. Um, and then you bring that expertise and your knowledge of the members, you know, the congressional members' uh, priorities. Uh, so even if you haven't worked on the campaign, you may yeah. bring that political asset to the administration. Um, and that's that that's helpful in itself. And even if you haven't worked on the Hill, as I think Lisa's uh, suggesting, if uh, one of your advocates is a member of Congress, that is significant because the administration will want to um, keep those people happy and be responsive to their uh, views. Let's let's turn to um, that aha moment. Something that surprised you in your roles uh, in your political appointee uh, positions that is not necessarily evident um, as even even as we talk about the political appointment process what surprised you what would you say to your younger self um, as people are thinking about uh, entering a political appointment job uh, any one of you I think for me it was the time that it took to fill the roles and I think recognizing that these offices that are really that you know the transition team the white house everyone's trying their hardest to do to to do the job but i remember when we first got into um into our you know like basically day one of the white house and i remember being told you know the, the president's in charge of appointments you're in charge of disappointments um, you know, for every 10 people, for every one political job out there, there are 10 people, you know, gearing up, for, trying to get it, nine people disappointed they didn't get it, and one person who thinks you waited too long to give it to them, right? So it's a tough process, both from the folks who are staffing the government, as well as from folks who, by all means, you know, seem very well suited for a presidential appointment. It's just recognizing that the process is much bigger than any one of us and any in and, and it's you know that there are all kinds of different things that are happening 
that don't bear, none of it is personal. Like none of it is personal. It has nothing to do really with your own, you know, very little to do with your qualifications or whether you even make a good candidate. There's just much bigger things that are being discussed. So I know from, from my, you know, time in presidential personnel, I, I will no longer take any of this personally at all because it's just, it's, um, you know, the process is as it is for a reason and it has nothing to do with, you know, any individual candidate. I agree with that. Uh, um, you develop a thick skin. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. You can't take it personally. Sometimes you're just, you know, a pawn. I'll, I'll just say, um, you know, you asked for an aha moment. And I, at first, uh, Alejandro, I interpreted that a different way, sort of how did you feel? And I just say, I was so happy. I was on a six to 12 month high when I started at the Justice Department. I felt so proud to, to be serving President Obama. Um, I thought I was part of uh, such an important historic effort, and I was part of a great team. Um, and uh, even though I had one little corner, one little sliver of the government that was my responsibility, I knew I was contributing to something that was so much bigger than myself. And then, you know, for jobs like mine, you get invited to some of the White House events, you know, the Christmas party or the Hanukkah party or the Easter egg roll, you can get tickets to that. Uh, Lisa and Lisa know well, those are just exciting events to, to, to be there in the White House. Um, so there's a big payoff after you get through the ordeal that we've each described. Uh, there's there's uh, gold at the end of the rainbow. You're muted, Alejandro. Alejandro, you're muted. Sorry. Lisa Brown, any advice you would give to your younger self as to uh, what you would do differently or that aha moment in, in the most recent appointment that you had? No, I, I think what I was mulling over is um, I think for their, their the White House tends to have very junior and then very senior mm -hmm, appointees. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the junior folks were always so reticent to leave. And I, I found myself saying to them, you know, there are great jobs at agencies. You do not the White House. And I think that's just something that's really important to remember. And, you know, that, and then there's also at Justice, right? I went in as a career employee, too. So there are great law jobs all over the government. Um, and so just keep that in mind. And I think the other thing I would say to keep in mind, which Lisa's indicating, is be sort of, um, don't take it personally and be patient, because the process does take a while. So it's not as though if you don't get something in January, that you're not going to, because it, it really does take a while to, to play out. And if there's a second term, there's a whole nother turnover with new people coming in. And, you know, the average tenure is what, eight, I think 18 weeks, 18 months, sorry, not 18 weeks, 18 months in a job. And they're, you know, they are, they're, they're fabulous, but they're also grueling. Um, and, you know, I remember after I left Vice President Gore, I kept running into people and they were like, you look so good. <laughs> Did I really look that bad before? Was I that exhausted? Um, so. I, I, I should add, uh, building on what Lisa just said, because I spoke about my six to 12 month high, I did job for three years. <laughs> so the last two years were a slog. Um, and it, it corresponded really with um, the Republicans taking over the House for and later the Senate. Um, it just, it becomes a different kind of uh, activity when yeah. you're fighting against Congress. And by the way, as we talk about all of this, it's gonna make all the difference in the world if President Biden, if President Biden, if President Biden uh, is elected, if, if he has uh, you know, a Democratic majority in the yeah. Senate. It'll yeah. just be yeah. a very different experience for everybody, including nominees, because as I said, it's all up to the majority now. Yeah. I want to, I, I, Lisa Brown, you, you reminded me, I started in the Clinton administration at the White House, and I thought that that was it. But when I went to the administration and under Obama, I realized just the incredible breadth and scope of what agencies and departments do and, and how much I grew and how much my skills uh, were, much, were greatly appreciated because as Ron said, you're working with teams. You're working with teams to really move the needle. Um, but but a, a very important point as well, um, Lisa Brown, you mentioned 18 months. I've read that for Democrats, uh, usually for Republicans, they usually stay around 18 months. Democrats stay much, much longer. And part of what this conversation is about is also um, because these are grueling jobs, it's, it's a relay race in many ways, right? Making sure that you can come in, give the best, move the needle, 
and then, uh, you know, go, go and do some incredible things. Um, I just want to turn to um, a couple of recommendations for, uh, there was a question in the chat box uh, from a, a, a law clerk, a federal law clerk. And they, and this individual asked the question, um, what can uh, individuals who are clerking right now do, given that they can't do, uh, be on a campaign or, or do some of the politics, what recommendations would you give uh, individuals who are clerking right now in order to um, be part of the appointment process? Ron, you may want to, you probably answer that question. Sure. Uh, you know, um, I'll say it's, it's probably harder um, because you don't have the opportunity to network in a partisan way. Um, but, you know, clerks are often very well qualified uh, by virtue of their you know, intelligence and their education um, to, to play a role. Um, it would tend to be a more junior role, I think, someone coming out of a federal clerkship. Um, so don't hesitate to make your interests known to, for example, ACS as it develops its bank of uh, um, individuals who might be considered. And then, you know, uh, clerks still have the opportunity to uh, um, be involved in legal organizations uh, um, where they may meet people um, and put themselves forward. It may be that, you know, the uh, most straightforward way would be to go into a non-political role first and hope to develop relationships that then uh, qualify you for a political appointment. So let's talk timing. Um, again, re being mindful of what Ron uh, stated at the beginning, this is not a, uh, we're not measuring anything at this point. All we're doing is being in, uh, providing information and demystifying the process. But there are several individuals on the chat box that are asking, what can people do right now? Um, and is this a good time to start um, uh, sending uh, information and resumes to ACS database? Um, any, any particular guidance of what individuals can do right now, just thinking down the road? I mean, I would assume, you know, regardless of who the candidate is, they're probably getting ready for, I, I know that I have some friends, for example, who are helping out on you know, election law type issues, there's boiler, you know, kind of volunteer roles with the campaign that aren't actually paid positions, but are legal in nature. If um, something like that appeals to you, I would reach out to the campaigns um, and try to get involved. I mean, I think every little bit helps. And I think if, um, you know, regardless of um, your kind of status right now in terms of how much you've done, there's still plenty of time between now and the election to actually get involved if this is something that you're interested in. You know, but like Ron said, I mean, you know, some of these jobs do go, you know, if you're at a, let's say you're an associate at a law firm, for example, some of these roles will be filled by more senior level people at your law firm. And so knowing who they are and who's really plugged in and getting to know them is also a good, a good thing to do and, and asking them for advice. Um, you know, at the end of the day, presidential personnel would have to sign off on your appointment, but um, there are a number of folks at DOJ who did get in through various law firm connections. And practically speaking, keep in mind some of the things that Lisa said earlier, right? Make sure that you're, you've paid your taxes, you've paid taxes on your nannies, your gardener, right? Just, just check, make sure you're, you've got all that nice and clean so that if when you get to the point of being considered, um, you're set. Keep, keep your CV up to date so that you can move quickly if the moment uh, arises. You're ready to send your materials in. Yeah, and, and we've shared some of the forms also uh, in the chat box uh, just so that you can get familiarized. Uh, a lot of these forms are asking you to go back 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, it could range 10 years of not only employment, but how many times have you been out of the US? Um, so there's a lot that you may be surprised, uh, but just look at the forms in case you, again, as, as you think about these appointment, uh, the appointment process, because there's a lot of information that's going to be asked, whether you're a Schedule C or a, or a Senate confirmed. Um, yes, go ahead, Ron. So one other important thought about the timing. When the administration starts, if it's a new administration as it was in 2000, uh, end of 2008 into 2009, it's like a crush of people trying to get through a revolving door. <laughs> and it's 
hard, and some people will get through, but many people won't. Uh, over the course of the administration, the crowd thinned a little bit, right, Lisa Elman? Absolutely. Right, and so, you know, don't feel discouraged if you don't get in in that initial uh, batch of appointees. Um, there'll be time in, you know, the administration lasts for four, four long years, <laughs> at yeah. least, as we've seen. Yeah. Um, yeah, there will be a second wave even within the first term. Right, yeah, we talk about a second wave. We used to talk about the second wave in a different way than we talk about it now, but yes, a second wave. So I want to go back to something that was mentioned at the very beginning of this conversation, which were boards and commissions. Um, what's that all about? How do you find those boards and commission? Who can serve on those boards and commission? Are they all in Washington, D.C.? Um, any, any perspective on that? Well, I, I can just say my, my office mate actually handled all of the both ambassadors and also boards and commissions nominations. And I just remember there are boards and commissions for literally absolutely everything. <laughs> now, a lot of those are agency appointed and then approved by the White House. But, um, you know, so if you're in, in healthcare, if you're in, you know, depending on what your area of specialty is, you can look and figure out what the boards and commissions are on your particular area of expertise and look into it. A lot of these things, they're not full-time positions, really. They're kind of part-time, the, you know, Kennedy Center board, you know, the, like they're all for arts and humanities and pretty much, you know, anything you could imagine um, is covered under these boards and commissions. So it really depends on what your particular area of expertise and specialty is. Um, but you can just, um, you know, they're generally appointed by the agencies and approved by the White House. Um, but there will be a lot of people who are, you know, I want to be on the fisheries board from, you know, like from New Hampshire or whatever, like that, you know, there will be particular people with very particular interests and the boards and commissions are a good option for those folks. And, and these are different from uh, federal advisory committees, are they, or are they the same? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that they're generally different from, I think that there may be some overlap. I'd have to look into exactly okay. that, but, um, yeah, so I'd have to look into that. Any other comments on experience with boards and commission? And the advisory uh, committees are often not full-time jobs. They're kind of once a month or something, it's a meeting, um, whereas the boards themselves, and many of these boards are either by statute or practice, bipartisan. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a seven member commission where no more than four members can be of the same political party. So uh, that's how some of those get, get filled. There's another question in the chat regarding are all political appointments based out of Washington, D.C.? No, there are many regional appointments, including just U.S. attorneys, for example, across the country. So there's a role for individuals to play both um, as a full-time political appointee or as a uh, serving on a board and commission, and not all uh, uh, appointments are based out of D.C. So there's opportunities for individuals across the country to serve our, our, our nation in, in multiple ways. Any other guidance of other opportunities that you think may be a way for individuals to be able to serve during a, a, a new administration or new president? I would just mention on the regional appointments, it's often very important to have the local support of like your senators or members of Congress in, the, in those areas. So, you know, generally we would always consult with the relevant and, you know, Ron would know this, but like we would always consult with the relevant congressional um, offices um, for when, before making those appointments. So we talk about, uh, go I'll ahead. Just one quick thing, um, think about it, other ways to serve. Um, because, as I said, any uh, Senate and House staffers go into a new administration, it opens up positions on the Hill. So those jobs are difficult to get in general, but uh, there'll be more jobs and of course, new Congress, new members. Uh, so that's a place to serve. Um, and that may well be serving the new administration. If, uh, if, if it's the president's party, you'd be working on legislation uh, that uh, is, is uh, important to the administration. That's an excellent point, Ron. Thank you for bringing that up because you're absolutely right. There is a shuffling of people across Washington, D.C. And there's no, uh, there's no, um, another amazing place to work in is uh, either the House or the Senate. Just understanding uh, the workings of Congress is a fantastic opportunity. Um, so parting, as we, as we bring this portion of our panel, uh, parting uh, recommendations or advice. And 
how do we, and, and the second part of, to this question is, we talk a lot about the hard skills, right? Being a you know, critical thinker, a good writer, uh, someone with um, great um, legal experience. But what about some of the soft skills? And Ron, you mentioned it in terms of being a team player. What about temperament and judgment? At the end of the day, we're still representing the president of the United States. Um, how would you approach that? And what advice would you give? I think there's several things. So one thing that I, when you're in the White House, that I remember thinking when I first went in with Vice President Gore, people were like, you know, oh, I can't wait to read about you in the newspaper. And I was like, no, if you read about me in the newspaper, I something bad has happened. And so I think there is a piece of of disc discretion is hugely important. Not dine if you dine out on stuff, it will. It, there is just a good chance it's going to come back and bite you. Um, and uh, I think comfort with the pace is important because on many of these jobs, the pace is intense. And so being sure that your family actually, this is a family endeavor um, when you take, often when you take one of these jobs. Um, and I guess the other skill set I would say is being, there's the, is it legal test? And then there's the, do you want to read about this on the front, post, front page of the Washington Post test? And having the, const as even as a lawyer thinking about the communication side of this and how is something going to play um is tends to be very important too yeah i would also man just add to that all of those are really important that lisa mentioned management i mean a lot of these roles are kind of management roles and so experience as a manager is very important for some of these jobs that that's a great point especially when you're managing individuals who have been in these agencies much longer than you have and are much well versed in the issues um, how do you manage uh, uh, manage a very diverse group of people um, yeah, so that's an excellent point yeah and who are going to have very different ideas of what the agency should be doing than necessarily the president wants to do and so you know um, being able to handle that dissent and understanding how to how to listen and learn and but you know make kind of the whole staff feel as part of a team I think is a really important skill set for political appointees to have. I'll let, you know I'll jump in to say uh, the words that I've heard that are so important discretion judgment management ability um, I'll say maturity you know it sort of covers some of these um, and really you know so then when any of us are looking at, you know, a slew of very well qualified applicants for a position in one way or another, you know, your reputation is so important. Mm -hmm. your reputation for discretion, your reputation for being a team player, your reputation for hard work. Um, you know, we build a, a resume or a CV, building a, res a reputation uh, in all our jobs and, and, and it's gonna come back in a good way or a bad way. Um, I know people who, you know, when they had, for example, some Hill jobs were just jerks <laughs> to, to people who came to see them. And then, then when their member left, they couldn't get another job because every, they no longer had the protection of a member and all they had was their reputation, which was bad. And in contrast, people who have impressed others along the way in their legal career, um, it, it will pay off, uh, if not now, in the future. I would add um, humbleness in this process yes. because, you know, I, I was very young in my career when I was at the White House and it was exciting. And uh, as, as so many of you know, you're, you're in this bubble and it, it can distort your sense of self and reality. Um, and then when it all ends, you have to, you know, ask a lot of forgiveness to all of those friends that you ne neglected for some time. Uh, make sure that you that you did well uh, in terms of being respectful to others because all that can disappear and as Ron said uh, all you have le uh, left standing on is your reputation so having a bit of that humbleness which is hard right um, you know it's 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 incredible to be able to go to a White House meeting and and be in front of a secretary um, but being having that ability to be humble is is very important. So we have reached the the part now where we open it up to Q and A's, um, and I see that there's a lot of questions in this chat box as well as in the Q and A box. Um, but some folks want to get a little deeper. How are political appoint uh, appointees um, compensated? We never talk about that. 
is there a set, is, is this a negotiation or is there a set scale that the federal government? Yeah, I mean, there's a scale. Not well is the first answer. Yeah, yeah not well. <laughs> You're not making private sector money in, in the government. But no, it's not, it's not necessarily set for the lower level jobs. It's, it's set for the higher level jobs. They will likely, and this is actually some um, advice that I give to young lawyers who are thinking about potentially going into an administration at some point or into a federal government job. Your salary will be generally key to your last job. And so if you were at a law firm, um, your salary, for, even for you know six months, your salary would be key to that law firm job versus going mm -hmm. you know, from a campaign position into the government, at which point you, they would just look at your campaign salary. So it can often be beneficial to being in the private sector before going into the federal government for salary purposes. In my experience, it's pretty regimented. I mean, at the highest level, there's the SES scale, and then at another level, it's the GS scale. Um, and there may be some play in the joints, but as Lisa said, no, as Lisa Brown said, we're not, no one goes into it to make a fortune. Each better job I got paid less. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and also, they're also um, agencies generally pay more than the White House. So, uh, you know, another thing to just mention, a lot of the White House jobs are actually detailed positions. So you, you actually are your home agency is um, you're at another ag agency and the, essentially the agency loans you to the White House. And in some ways, that's a really good way to be at the White House because you're getting paid the agency salary, which tends to be a bit more, still not great, but tends to be a bit more than you would otherwise get at the White House. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I agree with Lisa Brown uh, and all of you, not, not enough, uh, definitely not enough. But it's, uh, the, 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 the theory is that we're compensating you by the glorious opportunity to serve your government. So that's the, that's the uh, intangible compensation. So um, a couple of other questions that we have here um, are regarding um, Someone said, relating to social media, thoughts on the effects of photo of college parties and seemingly innocuous, bad, quote unquote, bad behavior, like underage college drinking or the sort. Um, you know, what, what, do, what do you say to what some may deem as youthful indiscretions that are posted on social media? Where do you think we will, we will go from here? I just say, we say to the law students as whatever um, path they're following in the law, that they will be haunted by foolish uh, postings and photographs on social media. So that's an early part of law school counseling is to, to, to say, don't do that. And, you know, some people have it from high school and it is what it is, it tends to live. Obviously, the further you get away from it, you know, when you're a 50 year old person, what you did in high school tends to be less important, but it could, if it's bad, it's bad. And I think somewhat right drawn to that point, it depends a little bit. If it's a picture of you at a party with a beer is different than you making a racist or sexist comment or you, right? There are some things that are just, they're gonna be a, they you got, are gonna be a problem and other things that will be more easily chalked up to youthful indiscretion. Yeah, and we have to underscore at the end of the day, you know, when, when, we, when anyone goes up for these positions, um, if there is anything that's embarrassing it's not just embarrassing to the candidate, but what we're trying to do is to make sure it's not embarrassing to the president and to the administration because it can be used politically against the president's, trying to get the president's agenda done. Um, so again, part of this is, it's not personal. It's really making sure that we find the candidates that are going to move uh, the president's agenda forward in a way that's not drawing attention or derailing um, and I just make that clarification only because it can feel as if, you know, it's, it's a personal matter that you don't want me as part of the team. Um, any, as we, as I look at some of these uh, questions, um, I'm also thinking about um, what, what, uh, what other elements do you think may not have been in the vetting process back in the Obama administration and surely in the Clinton administration that you think this moment in time, we're going to be, we're going to need to be more um, careful about. Race. I think it, it, given what's going on in the world right now, I mean, you've looked, you've seen these stories, right, of different elected officials who have 
you know, pictures from in blackface or whatever, that the, I think that's a, that is going to be a problem if it's a democratic administration. Mm -hmm. There'll be a lot of scrutiny around that. And post Me Too, there's going to be more scrutiny around if there have been allegations against you um, for any type of sexual misconduct. No, that's a, that's a great point. Um, I want to go back to, and there's a question here that says, what role do resume banks like ACS play in uh, the thought process of people with hiring authority? So Lisa Elman, um, resume banks, um, did you reach out, would, would the administration reach out to groups like ACS and others um, to get uh, ideas and recommendations of appointments? Yeah, especially for certain types of appointments, right? I mean, where, where ACS would be particularly well suited, for example, where we're, we're looking for, you know, some strong women lawyer candidates for this position. And what we've come up with hasn't really, you know, we haven't been able to come up with a good slate of candidates. So we would go to ACS for that, you know, so it's often we'll, we would have like specific kind of ideas in mind in terms of what we're looking for. Um, but I mean, absolutely, I think the resume bank that you guys are building is really great. They're at the appropriate time if, you know, whether it's, you know, um, this year or in four years or whenever it might be, there would be, you know, the, the new president would ha also have their own resume bank that you, even if you're going for, you know, like a very senior level position, you always want your name in there. And the idea is that we would, you know, so a lot of these jobs have, you know, they'll say, well, we want someone with particular experience in this, and then you would search for that keyword. So the key is you want to make sure that your resume is broad enough that it covers all of your various things that your um, areas of expertise that a federal agency could be interested in, um, beyond just the fact that you're a lawyer. I mean, the reality was, you know, there were, there on the Obama campaign, we had just of paid campaign staffers, we had 1,000 paid campaign staffers who were lawyers on the campaign. And, you know, there were about 100 jobs that we could maybe put them in. So there are only so many jobs available, but like we've talked about, there are a lot of non-legal positions mm -hmm. that are also really good policy positions where lawyers would make really good candidates. And a lot for a lot of those positions, you know, more specialized skill set in terms of healthcare or immigration or whatever it might be, um, you want to make sure that those keywords would pop up in any search. There's a question here, which is pretty interesting. And, um, and it's uh, an anonymous attendee. He says, I have heard that there is a specific dollar amount of campaign contribution that individuals should make in order to truly be considered for an appointment. Can we demystify that a bit? No. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not true. true. And if anything, trying to play that game is going to can make it harder for you because it, they don't. Nobody wants an allegation of having bought a position, right? So. Yeah. No. I mean, the only caveat I would say there is that it's a good way to network to be involved with a fundraising activity. So if you're like helping, you know, if you're going to events, it's a good way to get to know people. And um, but but it's not the matter of you know I gave a thousand dollars that's going to get you the job, certainly. So just for the record, there is no set amount that will secure you a political position. Okay. Absolutely not. Thank, thank you for, for demystifying that because uh, uh, that's a critical one. I think Lisa Brown, you, you, said, it, uh, you said it very well. Um, these are not positions that are for sale. These are positions that we are looking, that the, the incoming uh, administration is looking for the best talent and, and the best individuals to, to move the needle and, and move our country forward. So I, I appreciate that, um, that clarification. Um, any other, I'm going to go through the, the chat box in a second. Any other uh, type of questions like that, that you've heard that is like completely off the wall and yet people still think it's true? So do you, does, does the fact that your member of Congress uh, writes you a letter, does that secure you up a, a political appointment? It can be helpful. It doesn't secure the appointment, but sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's a voice. It also kind of depends, right? If the member of Congress is on the relevant oversight committee for that agency, it can be more helpful. If that member of Congress is particularly relevant that such that their political capital matters in that context, then it can be very relevant. 
but but just you know a, a letter that's not that's not as focused could be less helpful so it just depends on the context mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, there's a question here that says, beyond legal positions and non-legal positions in drafting policy, what other positions that have nothing to do with, with one's legal background can we look at for applying? I mean, there's comms communication jobs, there's ad advanced jobs, there's budget uh, jobs. So what other, what other positions which are out there that you, would, uh, that you think um, individuals with a legal background would be good at? I mean, legislative affairs is a good one. That doesn't always require you to have a legal background, but that's that's true. Um, in the Justice Department, we were we were lawyers, but uh, really wouldn't need to be, uh, you know, licensed. Um, trying to think of other things to do. I mean, one observation is that every agency is involved in regulatory work and you know, uh, bringing a regulation through the process. That's legal work, I would say. Mm -hmm. also, like, there's office of public engagement like no. if you want to just be the external facing i mean the white house has an office of public engagement that's just an external facing person that would interact for example with 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 groups like acs and others um those roles tend to be less substantive but you have a lot of access to a lot of really amazing people in the private sector and in the nonprofit sector and you know a lot of people so a lot of times those roles are also highly coveted um, one question from our, uh, our board member, uh, Ruben Garcia, he sent the question that says, should 2021 law school graduates start thinking about presidential appointments? So these are the law students who are graduating, hopefully May of 2021. Um, what would you recommend to them uh, as to whether or not they should be uh, up considering an appointment process, an appointment? So, so first of all, you're gonna pay Bar, <laughs> study bar. <laughs> um, we'll see if it's a remote bar or an in-person bar by next spring. Um, look, I mean, right fresh out of law school, as we've said, there are possibilities. It won't be the top job. You're not going to be a, you know, you're not going to be the deputy attorney general or the deputy secretary of commerce. But um, but there are positions um, in agencies. Um, if you spent your law school career, if one of the things you've done is uh, highlighted your interest in, in, in government and involved yourself in different activities, you may have a profile that would qualify you. Um, so I would say don't give up, you know, absolutely consider it. I, it it's gonna be difficult um, coming right out of law school. So you know, I would suggest don't put all your eggs in that basket, but if it's your dream, it's worth exploring. I, I would also say that um, I, in my my previous position at Commerce, I, I did hire individuals who had not passed the bar, but really had incredible talents and wanted to serve. And they opted to go into the administration and then prepare for the bar exam, um, you know, step down and then prepare for the bar exam. But it gave them also that uh, a little bit of uh, that respite. Um, everyone has their own path, but there are opportunities, just like Ron said, um, it won't be easy, but if that's one of your dreams, then uh, by all means, uh, please go for it. Um, so as we're get, nearing our, our close, um, just want to summarize some, some closing, some closing uh, uh, comments, but also some advice. Uh, top three things you would say to individuals, and let's try to do it both thinking about the senior level, um, at the senior level, and then uh, the schedule C's. Uh, what would you respectively say um, to candidates in those two tiers um, in terms of uh, next steps or things that they want to consider um, given all the wonderful information that we've, we've given them so far? I'm going to start with Lisa Brown. Any, any uh, parting thoughts or recommendations that you would like to share? Alicia, you're muted. Sorry about that. I almost made it all the way through without doing that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I was thinking as we were talking earlier, one thing we haven't talked about is in addition to overt politi partisan political work, like volunteering for the campaign or you know, fundraisers for people, um, is 
your other activities matter too, right? They're, they are, you know, President Obama is going to be looking for progressives. And so that part of your, that part of your resume and ensuring that is robust is also important because it goes both to sort of substantive areas that you've shown a commitment to um, and the, your commitment to the cause that we were talking about earlier. Um, and then secondly, I would, I guess I would emphasize both the um, networking side of this, of really looking, you know, staying in touch with all the people that your, your, your network is in. If you're at a law firm, as Lisa's indicating, think about who you see getting appointed and, you know, is that somebody you've worked with before? So you express interest to them or they express, they, they say that you're, they tell somebody else they're interested. Um, and then the other piece is don't, as Lisa said, don't take it personally, right? This is a scrum at the beginning. And you just, you're going to, you know, be patient and don't let your own sense of self turn on whether or not you get the, the job that you want. That's great advice, Lisa. Um, sometimes uh, the journey is, is, uh, is where the fun really lies uh, and not that ultimate destination. So this is, this is definitely a process where the journey will be winding, but it can be extremely uh, rewarding. Um, Lisa Elman, any any closing comments and uh, recommendations that you would have? Yeah, I mean, first, I just want to acknowledge that we're in a pretty strange time with COVID right now, right? So um, a lot of the, you know, we've talked a little bit about networking. I think it's incredibly important as well. Um, it's a bit more difficult right now just because we're all virtual. Um, but I wouldn't let that stop you. I would still try to reach out to people, introduce yourself over Zoom, even if it's over Zoom, um, and you know, try to build relationships, even if you, even if it's just a little bit more difficult right now. Um, I think that's still really important. The second thing I would just harp on: get familiar with the Plum Book, have an ask, understand what you're looking to do, but also think broadly. Um, about what you, what, you know, recognizing, you know, I think one of the themes of our conversation today has been, you know, you're, there are so many different political appointments out there. There are so many different jobs that could be appropriate for you that you might not even know about. And so understand what the roles are, understand that all of the, all of the legal jobs are not just at, at DOJ. Every general counsel's office, every agency has legal jobs. Um, think about substantively, you know, if you're, you know, recognizing that this will be an important step in your career, um, what do you want to be doing long term? And if, you're, if your dream is to be working in healthcare, then, you know, you want to probably try for something at HHS or some related agency. Um, there could, but there could be other places that would also be appropriate. Um, same with, you know, if you're, um, you know, think about the substance of what you're doing as well as just the being a lawyer part. And I think a lot of the people who are most successful were able to be, you, you kind of want to hit both be a generalist, but also have specific things in mind that particularly suit you. And so think through all of that and be well prepared for whatever might come, whether this year in four years or whatever it might be. That's uh, great, great counsel. Um, Ron, as, as I turn to you and as we bring this panel to a close, um, uh, obviously, we have some incredible individuals on this on, on this uh, uh, session, but also, again, just to uh, remind you of the question, how would you speak to the amazing students at, uh, uh, at your uh, law school who are thinking about this? Uh, because we have so many incredible students across our ACS chapters. And then how would you talk to the individuals who are much more seasoned? Um, what are some of those parting um, advice and guidelines that you would Parting give? words. Parting words of wisdom. Well, um, I guess I want to summarize, I think we would all say, Lisa, Lisa and I would all say, go for it. Um, give it a try. If it's your dream, if public service is something you uh, care about and it motivates you, absolutely try to do it. Um, at whatever level, you may, you know, you'll find out, <laughs> it sorts out sort of like a if you've ever been in a tennis tournament, uh, you find out where you are, <laughs> you're a 3-0 or a 3-5, you'll find out whether you're ready to be, you know, uh, a cabinet official or a sub-cabinet official or a Schedule C um, as you go through it. But um, absolutely try, and we've hopefully given you some tools and suggestions for how to position yourself. Uh, but then the second thing I would say is have perspective, uh, recognize that it's tough. Um, as I said, kind of everybody trying to get through that revolving door. Um, but, you know, stay with it um, and maybe over time, 
you'll succeed. And in the meantime, um, enjoy life, enjoy you know, your family and your recreational activities. This isn't everything that defines you. And then one, here's a practical point that I don't think we've touched on. If you care about public service, and if you find yourself unable to break through into the new administration at the federal level, consider service at the state or local level. Uh, so at my school, University of Baltimore, we have so many students who uh, are active in Annapolis in the, in the General Assembly in Maryland. Or now we have a, a you know, mayoral election in Baltimore, there's gonna be a new mayoral administration. So opportunities to serve the public are at all levels of government. And you can build your career that way, move from local state government into federal service eventually. So consider that as a path. One way or another, um, believe in public service, believe in the mission of helping people and uh, go for it. I, I love how this all came together. I, I want to thank Lisa Brown, Lisa Elman, Ron White for your incredible gems of wisdom. But, uh, and I should say, uh, what better way to encapsulate all of this? Go for it. That's exactly what we need to do, particularly at this moment in time. If you want to serve, if you want to serve your community, your, your local uh, government, your state, federal uh, we need all hands on deck right now um, as we move through this. I want to give a plug to make sure that for those who are participating, ACS has launched an incredible effort, uh, which is a resume bank. Uh, and we are looking at making sure that throughout our chapters, um, our members, uh, we are here to serve as a voice um, uh, for the legal, legal professionals who are in the progressive space. There's a lot coming down the pike for um, that um, our new president, Russ Feingold, is doing. We're excited that he's uh, on board. And for those of you who have served uh, ACS in one capacity or another, um, we always need more hands on deck. So thank you. I want to thank everybody. We're a few minutes early, but I know that we, we're all juggling. Um, if there are any more questions, I'm sure we will make sure to uh, answer those. But um, for the time being, I just I am full of gratitude because these are challenging times. And please take a look at, at Ron's um, recent article that was published in the Baltimore Sun. Um, there's a lot at stake uh, with this nom with this upcoming nomination. So uh, my my words of gratitude to everybody, and I hope to see each and every one of you in person sometime soon. But in the meantime, stay safe and, and stay strong. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having Thank us. You. Excellent. Thank Hello, you. Thanks for having us, yes. everybody.